everybody. Good morning and welcome to our second installment of Saturday Physics Honors for the fall semester. We have a really exciting talk today, so I don't want to spend much time uh, on the lead up, but I do have a couple of announcements real quick. One is, two weeks from today, uh, we have a... I have, we have, uh, Fred Lamb's going to tell us about uh, missile, intercontinental missile ballistic defense, and let me just tell you, Fred was the chairman of the American Physical Society Committee to review the feasibility of missile defense. Uh, they issued a, a large document uh, describing their results, and in fact, he was on a lot of news shows at NBC, et cetera, talking about this. He's a national expert. It's going to be a really exciting talk in two weeks, so I encourage you to, uh, to attend that if you can at all. The other thing I wanted to point out is that four weeks from today, that's on October 30th, we actually have an action-packed day. The first thing is uh, we have Professor Tony Liss, who's going to talk about uh, particle physics and the cosmos. Um, following that, I have to scroll down just a little bit here. Following that, uh, that lecture, we have tours of the research labs. And in fact, I think Brian's going to tell you a little bit today about what you might see uh, if you were to come on a tour of his lab. And we'll have a number of other labs. That's a very popular thing. And then finally on that day, specifically for high school students who might be interested in coming to the University of Illinois and majoring in physics, we have some extra activities we call Physics Day uh, for, for specifically for the students and their families. So if you or any of your friends are interested in coming here and, and being a physics major, uh, you might want to uh, think about coming and getting a chance to interact with some of the other students, talk to the faculty, talk to some of our alumni about what kind of jobs you can get in, in, uh, with a physics major. Uh, it's something we've been doing for the last few years and we've been getting a lot of positive feedback on that. I suggest if you're interested, you talk to Tony Pitts. She's out, uh, out front. You probably saw her on your way in. There is actually going to be an online uh, sign-up sheet for the physics day party. If you want to just come and see the talk and tour the lab, you don't have to sign up for anything. You just show up and have fun. If you want to stay for the for the latter part of that, we want you to sign up in advance. So, uh, and we'll we'll tell you more about that one in two weeks. Okay. So uh, those are the two uh, those are the two announcements. But one other thing I wanted to say before we move on with our with our program today is the the folks out front who helped set everything up and, and we're out there greeting you those are members of the University of Illinois Physics Society and uh, they're here uh, every Saturday for these programs um, for students who are interested in, in uh, science and, and technology majors things like that I encourage you to talk to them we really appreciate all the help they've done in, in putting this program together let's give them a round of applause I'm not sure who they were. They're those, those nice folks standing up in the back of the room right now, so you can stand around and stare at them and embarrass them a little bit. Okay, so on with today's program. Let me just say a couple of things. Brian DeMarco is, uh, is uh, what I, 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 would, I would classify him as one of the, the truly top young researchers in the world. And, and he came here to the University of Illinois uh, just a year ago, and we were thrilled to have him join our faculty. I just want to read off a couple of awards. Uh, before uh, to embarrass him before we get started. Um, just this year, he won the Office of Naval Research Outstanding Young Investigator Award. Last year, he won the Michelson Postdoctoral Lectureship Prize uh, at Case Western University. He won the Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics Outstanding Doctoral Thesis Award in 2002 for work on uh, what he's going to tell us about today, at least somewhat, the onset of Fermi de degeneracy in a trapped atomic gas. And the reason I wanted to mention that title is because Science Magazine listed that as one of the ten top uh, breakthroughs in the year of 1999. So Brian is someone who's on the cutting edge of research, and uh, like I said, he's one of the top young people in the world, and we're thrilled to have him here. He's also a great speaker. It's going to be an excellent talk today. And I just have one more thing to say before you start. I'm sorry. But if you Google him <laughs> on the web, which I encourage you to do. At the top of the list, you'll see the Brian DeMarco, and then next on the list, you'll see his alter ego, 6'7", 323 pound, offensive tackle for the Cincinnati Bengals, Brian DeMarco. <laughs> <laughs> so can everyone hear me all right? It sounds like the mic's working. Great, so I wanted to start by thanking Gwendolyn and Marion, who are sitting right here who uh, helped set up all these demos that we're going to see today and uh, actually help come up with some ideas for them. They, were, they do a terrific, great job on the physics department. So today we're going to talk about absolute zero. We're going to talk about the coldest temperatures in the universe, what it's like to make things at those temperatures at absolute zero, how we do it, what do they look like, how do they behave, 
And we're also going to talk about what temperature is all about. What is temperature? What does it mean that something's at zero temperature? And we're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be great. So I want to start by talking about why do I do what I do? What I, I like to work on the kind of things I work on because I feel like I'm living on the extreme edge of what's possible. And it's true. What I do is incredibly challenging and competitive. We're always working against other groups around the world. And I really feel like these guys at the X Games. I know it sounds kind of creepy. When I go in the lab, I feel like I'm doing something really hard. It's kind of risky. We choose really hard problems where we could fail. We could invest a lot of time and money, and we wouldn't get anywhere. And this guy's awesome. This guy won this dirt bike competition at the X Games this year. You're going to see in a minute. He's going to do a double back. It's the coolest thing ever. He's not quite here yet. When he sees he has 30 seconds left, he's going to go and try it. And so that's why look, we're always pushing technology. We're always living on the edge. And I think it's great fun. And the other thing that I really like about what I do is that what I do is incredibly useful. We work on fundamental research, but we also do things uh, using very cold atoms like I'm going to talk about today. Check that out. Aww, see that? Dude. That's awesome. But wait, and he does another one. And he won the gold medal for that. That was just a cool thing. And that's what I feel like. I get a thrill from what I do. So we, we make, uh, using cold atoms, we make the best clocks in the world, which are really very useful. So the whole GPS system, all the satellites, and geocircumous orbits that let you locate yourself. And by the end of next year, we'll let uh, 911 services locate your cell phone when you call. That relies on having really great clocks, atomic clocks, as time and frequency references. We also make the best gyroscopes. So there are atomic, uh, cold atomic gas experiments that get put now on helicopters and submarines that allow us to do things like measure rotation. The submarine that's really important. It can be way, way, you know, way under the sea, have no idea where you are, no reference to where you're going, but if you can measure how you're rotating, you can figure out where you're going. So I love it because it's fun, challenging, competitive, and it's really useful. We make great stuff. So let's talk about, start by talking about what temperature is. And you guys have probably all heard all kinds of things about temperature. And these days, if you want to know something, what do you do? You got on the internet, and you go to Google. It's the first thing. And if you go check on Google, and ask Google what's temperature about, they'll probably tell you something that you've heard before. Here, it's, this is one web page that I quoted from a uh, reference I found on temperature on Google. It says, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules of a substance. And the other thing you can go check is this thing called the Wikipedia, which is this free online encyclopedia that many of you may have seen. And there it says that when you increase temperature, that things move around more. And so this is a picture you've probably seen before, where if we talk about, let's say, the gas in this room is a bunch of little balls. So all the molecules, you can imagine, as little balls. And they're bouncing around, moving around. Actually, the molecules in this room are moving around about 300 meters per second. So they zoom all around. And they bounce off the edges of the room. And if something's cold, it means that all those molecules are moving really slowly. So you can see here that these guys are all moving at different speeds. But on average, they're moving kind of slowly compared to the hot gas that I showed here in the box. There, on average, there's some atoms that are moving really slowly. You can see there's one right there, kind of following the laser pointer. But on average, they're all moving really fast. So cold means things move slowly. Hot means things move quickly. And one thing you might guess is that at zero temperature, there's no motion. You've probably heard this before, that it's absolute zero, all motion ceases. Who's heard that in a, in a science class? I know I heard that when I was a kid in science class. OK. So, and that really makes sense if you think about temperature telling you about motion. The question is, is this really right? And this is kind of a loaded question, because if I brought this up, obviously I'm going to tell you something about it. And as this talk goes on, as I talk more today, you'll find out what temperature is really about, and if this kind of idea about temperature being connected to motion is right, or if it's wrong. So first, let's talk about temperature and how we measure temperature. Physicists use a funny scale of measure temperature. We use a scale measured in something called Kelvin, and I'll tell you how to connect that to something else you know. And it actually came from this guy, I always thought that uh, William Thompson, you can call him Lord Kelvin, I always thought he looked like a nice guy. This is an old picture. He looks friendly. And as a young guy, he looks, he looks like, just looked like a regular guy. And he came up with this idea of having a temperature scale that has a zero, that we call absolute zero. He came up with this idea that there's a temperature well, that you, it's the lowest temperature you can have. It's nothing lower than absolute zero. And then everything is measured on the scale, this big thermometer we have here. And so there's all kinds of things in the universe 
that measure on this scale. Actually, the hottest things right now are the core of supernova. And our best guess is that supernova, let's see, that's 100, here's hundreds, thousands, 100 billion degrees Kelvin. These are the hottest things that we know about in the universe now. And actually, I put that off the top of my scale of my thermometer. So those things are really hot. Actually, we have something kind of hot nearby us, the sun. The core of the sun is about 15 million degrees Kelvin. And the surface of the sun that we see is 6,000 Kelvin. And that's where I'm going to put the top of my temperature scale. So the thermometer here, we're going to talk about all kinds of other things and things that are hot and are cold. But we're going to scale everything right here. This top mark right here is 6,000 Kelvin, which is sort of the hottest near-Earth temperature that we have around. If we go down to the Earth and look at some of the hottest things that occur naturally on Earth, one thing that's pretty hot is lava. Lava's pretty hot. That's 1,200 degrees Kelvin. And you can see already that compared to the core of the sun and supernova, temperatures on Earth are already pretty cold. But we've already shrunk down. We're already looking at the lower end of the scale. And actually, I have something here that's hot. And you're all familiar with something that's hot. How do we shut the lights off? See, Gwendolyn's going to rescue me because she knows what's going on. I really have no idea. Light bulbs are hot. And so I brought a light bulb today that we can look at. I'm going to turn off the current for this light bulb a little bit. One thing you can see is that if I run a little tiny bit of current through it, it barely glows, it barely glows dull red. In fact, one thing I want to show you is that everything in the universe glows. What color it glows kind of depends on what temperature it's at. So when you can barely see a light bulb like this, or something hot, like maybe some coals on a fire, it's very, very dull red. That's about uh, 500 degrees Celsius, which is about 700 degrees Kelvin. As we turn it off, you can see, as it gets hotter and hotter, it starts glowing in orange first. And that's now about, oh, 700, 800 degrees Celsius, or about 1,500 degrees Kelvin. It's not so different than lava. And actually, you can see that picture of lava up there is about the same color as this lamp. And once we get it hot enough, it starts glowing yellow, and finally it starts glowing white. We can't really tell anymore how hot it is. Everything, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what color things are glowing, but everything in the universe is glowing. Everything what temp at some temperature is glowing, color is always related to the temperature. So there's lava, it's kind of red. Room temperature is 294 degrees Kelvin. What defines our temperature scales, physicists, what we use to calibrate thermometers is called a triple point cell. That's a special arrangement of test tubes and beakers where you can actually get water to coexist as a liquid, as a solid, and as a gas. And we do that at special pressure. That defines, actually, temperature. And that's how we calibrate every thermometer. Ice water at 0 degrees Celsius is at 273 degrees Kelvin. And so that tells you how we relate Kelvin to Celsius. So if you want to know what the temperature is of something in Kelvin, find out what the temperature is at Celsius and add 273 degrees. So there's 0 degrees Celsius. That's right. We all know ice water. Water is an ice. It's 273 degrees. 0 degrees Celsius, or 273 degrees Kelvin. Dry ice, which is frozen carbon dioxide, is 164 degrees Kelvin. We have some of that around here. It's pretty funky stuff. I'm going to put gloves on to touch it, because actually at these temperatures, I'll give myself a really bad burn if I try to handle it. And you can see it. Really cool stuff. It looks like ice. You can see it's kind of uh, subliming. So you can see there's some gas coming off of it. It's one of the neat things about frozen carbon dioxide or dry ice is that it actually uh, goes straight from a solid to a gas. So if I stick this thermometer on it, you can see on the side here are a couple thermometers. I kind of stick this and try to bury it in here. You can actually see how cold it is in Celsius. And you can see it's shrinking down. You've got the thermometer. It's the one on, on uh, your left. It's shrinking down to minus 70. Pretty cold. It's about minus 70 degrees Celsius. That's pretty cold stuff. You've probably seen that around before. Then, of course, one of the things everyone gets to see that's pretty cold is liquid nitrogen, which is at 77 degrees Kelvin. We have some of that here. And at that temperature, things start to get really cold. So here I can stick my thermometer in again. You can see the thermometer right sinks down to minus 200 degrees Celsius, which is about right. So 77 Kelvin is about 200 degrees, or minus 200 degrees Celsius. And all kinds of fun things happen with liquid nitrogen. 
You can freeze things like hoses, and if I'm not careful, I'll spit out the hose and burn my hand. We can break hoses and hit them with hammers, and you've seen this before, we can freeze all kinds of things. We can freeze flowers, we can freeze bugs, we can freeze you. One of the first accidents I had in the lab was I poured liquid nitrogen on my foot, and you give yourself a really bad burn. You have to be very careful with it, actually. So, where'd that go? So you can hurt yourself in other ways, too, if you're not careful. You're trying to do something dramatic. So liquid nitrogen is really pretty cool, and it's something we have around. I've seen it before. Uh, so that's always good stuff. Okay, so that's, now notice our thermometer is shrinking down closer and closer to zero. We're getting closer and closer to the lower end of the temperature scale. Actually, something else we have around the department is liquid helium, and that's at 4 degrees Kelvin. I didn't bring any of that because that's actually, you can really hurt yourself with that stuff. And uh, you've already seen a bit of my hurting myself, so we'll avoid that. The universe has a temperature. This is one of the coolest things. Did anyone see on NOVA, uh, it was this last week, this thing about cosmology, this special thing, anyone see that? Yeah. They talked about the cosmic microwave background. So the, there's actually heat left over from the Big Bang, and that heat takes the form of light. And the universe is glowing with this light, with that temperature. Okay, just like the light bulb glows, when it gets hot, the universe is glowing, and this mic it's glowing at microwave frequencies. And we've been able to image this and learn all kinds of great things about cosmology. In fact, this is really how the field of cosmology started, is by looking at the cosmic microwave background. It's a huge breakthrough. And the wavelength, of that radiation happens to be about two millimeters. So you can really see that. Everyone knows about how too big two millimeters is. Okay, you can kind of guess. That's a pretty long wavelength, but the universe is really glowing. In fact, one thing I forgot to mention is that at room temperature, things glow. And that wavelength is about 10 microns. 10 microns is about a tenth of the width of human hair. And so the whole room around you is glowing at that wavelength because it's at some temperature. So in the universe, at the coldest reaches, Anywhere. If you went off the universe away from everything, away from the star, away from anything that's warm, as you think of something being really hot, you find that the temperature around you is 2.7 Kelvin from all this radiation, this microwave radiation that's around you. So that's the coldest naturally occurring temperature of the universe. 2.7 Kelvin. A lot of physicists around here have something called a dilution refrigerator, which allows them to get even colder. The dilution refrigerator uses a mix of a couple isotopes of helium to get down to what we call 3 millikelvin. This is our, this is incredibly cold. Now we're just barely above absolute zero. And 3 millikelvin, we call it milli because there's, there's a third digit after the decimal here. So that's 3 one thousandths of a degree above absolute zero in the dilution refrigerator. What if you want to go colder? For a long time, in fact, we had no real way to go colder than this. And in fact, it didn't happen until about 10 years ago we could find a way to go much colder than this. And the way we got colder was time physicists came to the rescue. That's why I'm, I'm an experimental atomic physicist. I work in a lab like all these people. These are all people that worked on techniques during the 80s and the 90s to cool atoms down to incredibly low temperatures. There's all kinds of people that worked on this. There's a few Nobel Prizes here. This is Deborah Jin, who I worked with. And we were able to do with cold atomic gases. As far as we can tell, we're able to cool down to absolute zero. And I'm going to tell you how we do that. In fact, the lowest temperature we've ever measured becomes hard to measure temperature when we get this cold. It's 450 pico Kelvin. So look at this. So pico, we call pico because this is right here where this zero is. That's the 12th digit after the decimal. So that's barely, barely above absolute zero. When we get down to those temperatures, as far as we can tell we can get to absolute zero, but it becomes hard to measure temperature. We get really cold. How do we do that? It's amazing. In fact, these temperatures are the coldest temperatures in the universe, as far as we know. Now, there could be aliens somewhere. We're also atomic physicists, and they have a big lab, and they also cool down these low temperatures. In terms of naturally occurring temperatures in the universe, these are the coldest temperatures anywhere. And these are just here on planet Earth. We work in our labs. We find ways, to, really tricky ways to cool things down. And we get incredibly cold. It's amazing. So how do we do that? We do that using a bunch of experiments. These and people who work for me do this kind of thing. So these are uh, two people that work with me. This is Tom Gao, who's a postdoc. That means he already has his PhD who works with me. And his student, Matt White. And we have big labs. We have lots of lasers and equipment. And we're able to use all this stuff to cool down the temperature. And actually, all these experiments uh, we do in a vacuum system, which is like our thermos bottle. Okay, so 
this is a picture of our vacuum system up in our lab. And these two guys have just put it together at this point. That's why they're smiling and happy because we were able to do it without screwing up too badly. So they're really happy about this. Uh, and you can see here, there's, there's sort of some glass uh, tubes and cells where we're going to hold and trap at them. And there's some stainless steel and some vacuum pumps you can't see. And we are able to suck all the air out of this vacuum system. So we, we make very, very good vacuum. There's basically only a few molecules left of air inside this whole vacuum system when we're done. You get a pretty good idea of what size it is if you compare, for example, this to Matt's head. You know, this is, this is a glass cell about this big, and that whole vacuum system has a few molecules left of nitrogen. And that acts like a thermos bottle. And then we use two tricks to get atoms in there to cool them. The first is something called laser cooling and trapping. And the second thing is called magnetic trapping and evaporative cooling. So I'm going to talk about each of those things uh, right now. Just making sure I'm not skipping over any demos. Okay, the first thing we do is we need to collect some atoms somehow. So we, in this glass cell, which is right at the end of the vacuum system right here, you can see there's a bunch of windows. And we shine laser beams in those windows. And we turn on a small vapor. And in fact, we use something called rubidium atoms. They're just an atom, like any other atom. We turn on all sorts of those atoms. They fill up the vapor inside that cell. And we're able to turn on laser beams and magnetic fields to collect them from that room temperature vapor. And we can collect about 10 billion atoms and cool them down to about 30 microcolors. So that's micro because this is the sixth digit after the decimal. So that's 30 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. Already very, very cold compared to, for example, the ocean refrigerator and anything occurring in the universe. And how does this work? I have a cool little animation I made to show how this actually works. So the idea is uh, inside our vacuum system, we have this vapor. So here's like all the little atoms inside our vacuum system. And actually, you can see that they tend to collect right in the middle of my little animation right here. And that's because we use some magnetic fields to confine them. And actually, let me show you how that works. You're familiar with this even if you don't know it. Uh, so we have a floating magnet. One of taught me how to use this thing. Okay. All right. You've probably seen all kinds of magnetic toys before. This thing's common in lots of little sign shops and other places. This guy right here has a little bar magnet in it. In fact, every atom is like a bar magnet. It has a own little bar magnet inside of it. Think of it that way. And inside this uh, black mystery box, there's a bunch of magnets hidden. And they're arranged in the right way so that they can hold on to this bar magnet inside this little funny looking barbell and suspend it in free space. And you can see it actually will sit right there and spin. And it's not touching anything. In fact, Wendell and Marion did a better job than me of arranging it so you can see that gap just perfectly. There you go. And so all the magnetic fields inside this little black box and permanent magnets inside there set up the right kind of configuration of magnetic fields to grab and hold on to the bar magnet inside that little barbell do that. And we do the same thing here. We, we make some magnetic fields by running current inside some wires. And we're able to trap the little atoms which look at bar magnets and hold on to them. And that's what you see going on right there. And then what we do is we turn on some laser beams. And the trick with these laser beams is that they look like a molasses to the atoms. In fact, we call this trick mol optical molasses. Optical is lasers, molasses because it's like molasses. And anytime an atom goes through the laser beam, because of the way it interacts with the light, it feels like a huge frictional force, like it uh, is preventing its motion. So it slows down and it drags its feet and it can barely get through the, the uh, laser beam. And so you can see when I do that right now, and turn on those laser beams, the atoms slow down, they get cooled by the molasses, and they start collecting right in the middle. And there's some of these atoms which are in really, really excited orbits, and will eventually come and get collected down into what we call our magneto-optic trap, or MOP. Actually, we have this working now in our lab, and on October 30th, you can come by and see it. Unfortunately, a digital camera, I tried to take a movie, can't see our MOP, our little glowing ball of atoms very well, because camera companies put near infrared filters on their cameras these days. And the light we work with is in the near infrared. But your eye can see it. So if you come to my lab, you can come and you can see this little glowing ball of atoms suspended in the middle of this glass cell. So there'd be a little ball of glowing atoms right there. It's actually about as big as that laser uh, pointer dot. And it sits right in there, suspended in our vacuum thermos. So that's the first trick we use, is uh, a magneto-optic tracker, laser pulling and trapping. 
30 microkelvin, 30 million to the degree of basically zero, about 10 billion atoms. Already really cool. All right. Next trick is, trick is something you're all familiar with. And again, we're going to use magnetic fields that can find the atom. And we make magnet these magnetic fields using current carrying wires. And here's kind of schematic of it. This is what it looks like in real life. This is from a group in Germany. There's a bunch of actually this is Teflon things holding uh, wires that run current through. Typically, hundreds of amps, about 500 amps, to keep the wires from melting. We have water run water through the middle of them, so the wires are really tubing. And we use something called evaporative cooling to cool the atoms. And in fact, you all know about evaporative cooling because you are doing it right now. People keep themselves cool through evaporative cooling. It's called sweating. And that's the way your body regulates temperature. You're always sweating a little bit because you're always producing a lot of heat. You're like a light bulb. In fact, you're about a 60 watt light bulb. That's the amount of heat you produce all the time. And if you didn't find a way to cool yourself off, you'd get hotter and hotter and hotter until maybe you melted or you, know, you get kind of sick. Evaporative cooling is a way that you modulate your body temperature. So you're all familiar with it. And I'm going to try to now work this thing. And you also probably have experienced it before. As you can see, it's for a couple still near the, um, the dry ice, which is still some blinding. Uh, we're going to look at, at this guy right here. This is a thermometer again we're going to look at. When you go to the doctor, the doctor or the nurse takes alcohol and wipes it off your skin before they give you a shot. Probably not in your hand, maybe in your arm. <coughs> parts of your body we won't demonstrate. Uh, your hand always feels cool, right? And the reason for that is that the alcohol evaporates really quickly. And when, that evap when, that evap when the alcohol is evaporating, what's happening is the highest energy alcohol atoms are leaping off of your skin and taking away a lot of energy. And then your skin cools off. And you can see that happen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to squirt some alcohol onto this thermometer. This is just regular 200 proof alcohol, so we all have a good time with it. And uh, you can see right away that this thermometer drops in temperature. And it's actually a pretty strong change. And it's just from the alcohol evaporating off of the surface of that thermometer, this one right here, you can see it cooled down by a few degrees Celsius already. That's evaporative cooling. And you're, you, all, of, all of you are doing it all the time. The way we do it is we hold our atoms in a, a bowl, basically. So this magnetic trap that we make using magnetic fields works like a bowl. And the atoms are always rolling around in this bowl. Just like this atom here is rolling around in this bowl. And we use a trick to change where the edge of that bowl is. And the bowl has sort of a finite pipe, just like any bowl you mix up, I don't know, batter for cookies in your kitchen. And if the atoms have enough energy, they can roll up the side of that bowl and leap out. And the highest energy atoms will do that really well. They'll leap out and they'll carry away a lot of energy. And all the atoms left behind will have less energy and they'll cool down. And what we do is we lower the edge of that bowl in time in the right way so the atoms get colder and colder and colder because the highest energy atoms are always leaving out. So in this little demo, you can see the edge of the bowl is this black circle. So what I'm going to do is put a bunch of atoms in there, and we'll start lowering the edge of the bowl. So you can see that circle shrinking in, and as atoms hop out, they escape. So you can see there are a few that have escaped out the sides, and no one just hopped out, and oh, there's another one about to get out right there, left. And as this goes on, you'll see that the atoms start moving more and more slowly. Now they're moving much more slowly than when we started. Now they're pretty slow. And that's just evaporative cooling. You can do it again so you can see it. I just think this thing is pretty fun. So they're moving around, they're zipping around, they're really hot. And they're going to start evaporating, they start leaping out the edge of the bowl, and we shrink the edge of that bowl in. They jump out, they jump out, they jump out. I love these so you can kind of barely see them left. And eventually they get slower and slower and slower, colder and colder and colder. And this trick we can use to cool about a million atoms, one million atoms, down to temperatures as low as 100 nanopelvin. So it's 100 billionths of a degree above absolute zero. Typically this is what we do. So we call it nano. Nano means that this digit here is, in, is the ninth digit after the decimal. Or it's 100 billionths of a degree above absolute zero. And in fact, we can use this trick by working really hard to go down to, far, to zero temperature as far as we can tell. As far as we can tell, we can use this trick to get down to zero temperature, zero degrees Kelvin, absolute zero. You can see now the few atoms left, they're barely moving around. In fact, one of the things that's funny about this cooling technique is that uh, we have to throw atoms away to do it. We're always throwing atoms away 
And so that's why we start with 10 billion, but we're only left with 1 million at the end. But it's still enough to see them and look at them. And how do we look at them? We take pictures. We're just photographers. We thought we did something fancy. No, we just take pictures. We have fancy cameras to take pictures. What we do is we let we have the atoms that are really cold. So this is a picture of the gas. There's a bunch of atoms in there. And what we do is we shut off the, all of the magnetic fields that we use to confine them. And we let them expand for a tiny fraction of a second. So they all kind of fly apart because they have some energy. And the ones that fly apart, so the ones that have high energy, high velocity, they they barely move anywhere, so these are like these guys with really small arrows. And the ones with really high velocity, they really zip out and expand really far during that time. We call it time of flight energy. And then what we do is we shine a laser beam at them, and those atoms cast a shadow into the laser beam. So you can see where there's lots of atoms in the center here, the shadow is really dark. And then as you get out to the edges, the shadow is kind of weak. And then we take a picture of that shadow onto the camera. And you can see we, we make the, we sort of invert the color coding. So here where it's bright white, that's where there were the most atoms. And as you get out to the edges where it's blue and then you can't see anything anymore, that's where there were the fewest atoms. And so we just get all of our data from these pictures. We can figure out temperature, we can figure out the number of atoms, the density, all kinds of stuff. Actually, I'm going to take a break for a minute. I'm going to take any, just a couple questions in case anyone has some questions before we move on. I'm going to start talking about next what happens at these really low temperatures. Basically, I've seen zero. Do you want to have any questions about how we cool? Yeah, go ahead. How, how does the high conversion of certainty principle come into your equation? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, that's a good question. You're on top of it. Go ahead. Right, so, so this fellow is asking uh, temperature is a statistical measurement, not. Uh, so why do, we, why do we talk about temperature with a single body? The idea of temperature is it is an ensemble measurement, or measurement that we make a quantity to talk about where we get a lot of stuff. And here, the lot of stuff is all the atoms, a million atoms. So the, it's a property of all those atoms together. And that's why I was really careful when I said we throw away high energy atoms and not hot atoms. It doesn't make sense to say we throw away an atom that's hot. We throw away an atom that's high energy. Because it doesn't make sense to talk about the temperature of this one atom. How about the fellow in the back there? In the magneto optical trap. <laughs> go ahead. No, why don't you go ahead? In the magneto optical trap, where does the energy from those atoms go? Oh, that's a great question. That's a really tricky question. The energy from those atoms goes into the laser beams. What that means is the reason those atoms feel the blasts like force and get slowed down is they're scattering light. So they see this light, and actually the light scatters off of the atoms, and the energy gets taken away by the light that they scatter. And that's how that trick works. How about one more? Question, how about from the fellow right here? Has, has anyone been able to use uh, a magnetic trap like the Joe River to uh, and, and confine it so that you can find one atom and, and confine it so it doesn't move? So yeah, that's, that's a cool question. Uh, there are two answers to that question. One is that people have used, no one's used a magnetic trap to do that. But people have used something called, uh, we call it a poly trap. What does this really mean? It's a trap using electric fields with charged atoms. And we can use electric fields to find charge atoms. This makes sense, right? Like if we take a battery and we connect the battery to some plates, we can use it to hold a charge atom because we can keep it from moving around in the right way. But we can also use laser cooling tricks to cool it down so it's at zero temperature, basically moving as little as possible. And uh, those are experiments I did for like two years before I came here, actually. Um, there's great applications for those kinds of experiments. I'll talk about some more time. So, so why don't I move on? I mean, there's plenty of time for questions at the end, and uh, we can talk a little bit more. Let me tell you now what happens when we get basically to zero temperature. These incredibly low temperatures. Zero temperature, a few billionths of a degree above absolute zero, a half a billionth of a degree above absolute zero, basically zero temperature. What happens? Funny things happen. And funny things happen because everything in the world is awake. And something called quantum mechanics starts to become really important. So let's talk about that. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Well, how do I get to the ripple tank? Oh, you have it? Oh, this is the ripple tank. Oh, I've seen the light reflected off it. Oh, okay. Uh, everything in the world is awake. 
So what does that mean? It's hard to describe exactly what that means. I'm going to give you some demos to give you some feeling for what this means. Sometimes it's really hard to tell that things are a wave. Like you, you're a wave. It's really hard to tell that you're a wave. And the reason for that is everything in your body is moving around pretty quickly. And so it has a really short wavelength. And in fact, the way that you, the waves in your body interact with the world around you, those waves get even shorter and really localized. So that means that they really look like little wave packets that I've shown here for these atoms uh, moving around in my box. And you see some of these really fast ones that are zipping around. They have a little tiny wave which is really localized into a point. But if you can get things moving slowly enough so their wavelength is long, like the atoms in my cold gas here, here the wave is pretty long for most of these atoms, you can start to see the fact that things are waves. What happens for waves? Waves behave in ways that are, are interesting. Here we have what's called a ripple tank that Gwendolyn and Mary helped me set up. And we have a little plate of water, we have a couple uh, little rubber things which go into the water and make ripples in the water. And we can see it uh, if I turn up. Okay, so what's happening here, uh, if I can, okay, let's try something. I have just one, okay, that's pretty good. If I have one little rubber thingy dipping into the water, you can see we make waves that look like just like waves on a pond. Can we see that? So there's waves that are going out from this little rubber thingy, they make circles. It's like what you see if you take a pebble and throw it into the pond. But the funny thing about waves happens when you actually let waves overlap. Then they start acting funny. And now I have two rubber thingies in there. You can see where the waves from the two rubber thingies overlap, we get some funky looking patterns. So you can kind of see here, um, in the regions where the waves overlap, you see these stripes of bright and dark. That's something called interference. Where the waves overlap, they can add together in funny ways, and you can see funny patterns. And in fact, I also have a demo here to show you how, you know, this is a water, so this works like a wave, no big surprise, right? But in fact, all kinds of things in the world act like waves including electrons, and what I want to show you next is a demo where we're going to see some electrons uh, move like waves. And what I want to show you is the equivalent thing in the water tank first. So now I have uh, another source of waves. It's a long, thin strip. And it makes something called plane waves. And you'll see what that means. See these waves, they just look like lines. And they just move across. One thing about waves is that they do something funny when they go through barriers. So now I'm going to put a couple barriers in, in the wave tank. I have a couple barriers with just strips of metal. They're going to block most of the waves. I'm going to arrange them in a way that there's a little gap. And you can see that little gap is right there. Right there. It's my little gap. If I let the waves go through that little gap, remember they were straight waves to begin with. And once they go through that little gap, they come out and they look like little circular waves. Let's see if I can arrange this so it's a little better. Okay, so let's see if I can get it. You can kind of see it. So you can see that the waves do what's called diffraction. They go through the little gap and they come out and they start spreading out in a funny way. And the same thing happens for electrons. So what I'll show you is that, okay, water works like a wave. We're not surprised by that. But everything in the world, our atoms are waves, electrons are waves. And this gizmo here has a little hot filament that we're going to boil electrons off of. And there's an accelerator in here. If you think accelerators are big, giant things that live underground, there's a little accelerator in here, 5,000 volts. And what it does is it accelerates those electrons, and they're going to go and they're going to slam through a hole, a tiny hole, just like the gap in this water wave, in this water tank. What's going to happen when they slam through the hole is they're going to diffract. They're going to do something that looks just like what you saw here. If we can get this to work. And I have to switch over so you can see it. Fraction through hole number seven. Okay, so actually, you can see the, the beam of electrons uh, here. What happens is the electrons come through this hole, and they slam into a little glass surface here. And they fluoresce. And they fluoresce green so that you can see them. And that's what you see uh, as this bright dot. That's the bright dot on the screen right there. They fluoresce green. What you can see is if you get this working, you can see some rings. 
Everyone see those rings? Those rings are the electrons acting like waves. If the electrons didn't act like waves, you wouldn't see those rings. And it's because the electrons go through this little hole and they spread out, just like the waves in the orbit tank. So that's my message. Everything are waves. And at these low temperatures, when the waves become all really long, look at what's happening in this picture here, for the cold gas. Here's all my little waves, all my little atoms. Now, for a lot of these atoms, the waves are overlapping a lot of the time. Here, the hot gas, the waves aren't overlapping much. Right? No waves overlapping. Here, look at this area here. There's all these waves over overlapping like nuts. Something funny is going to happen. Just like something funny happened in the ripple tank. And the other thing I want to point out in this picture is that I've made this picture in a way where you can see even the atoms that are barely moving, like this atom right here, there's a shortest wave it can have. This is another important thing I'm going to come back to. The wave doesn't get as long as it likes. There's the shortest, sorry, the longest wave it can have. The, long, the wave doesn't get any longer than about that wave right there. Okay? And that's a characteristic of everything in nature. It doesn't get long, the waves don't get as long as you like. They get, you know, if, you're, if you have at something you're trapping a box, which is basically everything in the world, uh, the waves can only get so long. And that's an important thing. We'll come back to that in a minute. All right. What happens when the waves start overlapping? That really depends. And there's something else that you may not hear about a lot around you. And that's that everything in nature is, one, comes in one of two categories. Everything is either a boson, I like to think of them as cheerleaders, or a fermion, which are kind of like geeks and nerds like me. <laughs> like most physicists. That means everything, every atom, every particle, everything, you, are a boson or a fermion. Sometimes, you know, for you, it doesn't make much of a difference what you are if you're a boson or a fermion. Well, maybe it does to your social life. But, because it's really hard to tell that you're a wave, it doesn't matter. Bosons are things that are bosons. Their waves overlap as much as possible. So if you have a couple bosons in a box, atoms that are bosons, and the waves start overlapping, they find a way to arrange themselves so those waves overlap as much as they can. Fermions, look at this guy. This guy can't even look at the other geek. The waves won't overlap. Okay? They find a way to arrange themselves so the waves will not overlap. So everything in nature behaves this way, one way or the other. In fact, most things that you're familiar with, like the building blocks of matter, are, are fermions. Like electrons, neutrons, protons. And some atoms are fermions. Some atoms are bosons. It depends on how all the particles inside them get added together. So ultra-low temperatures, here's what happens. Things that are bosons find a way to arrange themselves so all the waves overlap as much as they can. So that's what you see happening here. When we cool them down to these crazy low temperatures, 100 billion to the degree above absolute zero, these waves all get together in the middle of our little trap and overlap as much as they can. Fermions do something different. And in fact, it's so hard to calculate this that my poor little laptop couldn't do it in real time. But the fermions find a way to arrange themselves so the waves don't overlap. So they all spread it, each, they spread out in our little magnetic trap. And they find a way to arrange themselves and they form sort of like a shell shells in a way that the waves will not overlap. In fact, they're zipping around in order to do that. They have to move around a lot so that the waves don't overlap. And we can see both these kinds of physics with our ultra-cold atom gases. This you may have heard about here in this department before. It's called Bose-Einstein condensation. This is those pictures that I've shown before, uh, but now they're, they're made into cool-looking 3D uh, representations. So this is like where, after we took our picture, this is where there are a lot of atoms, and out here there are very few atoms. And what you can see is if you go to really low temperature, all of a sudden this big spike appears in the middle of the picture. That's all the atoms going into the same kind of wave, all waving together. And in fact, remember I said I wanted to tell you that there's a longest wave that you can have in the system. That's the longest wave. So that's the, that's the most spread out the atoms can get. And actually what that means is, just like in this picture, the atoms are all still moving around a little bit. If they're waving, they have to be moving a little bit. So they're all still moving around a little bit, but they've all started waving in the same way. This is some data, actually, now I, I don't want to make this talk take too long, so I'm not going to explain this completely, but what happens with fermions, we can see this, this physics also. It doesn't make as dramatic pictures. Uh, actually, I can show up in the next slide. Let's do this. This is great data uh, from a group at Rice University, my friend Randy Hewitt there. They trap atoms that are bosons and fermions in the same trap together. And they cool them down to really low temperatures. 
temperatures. Here there are temperatures as low as 240 billionths of a degree above absolute zero. They're at the same temperature, and they take a picture. Remember, they let the gas expand a little bit, and they look at how much energy does the gas have. Here, as they cool down, the bosons have less and less energy. So in this picture, remember, the atoms have flown apart a little bit. They take a picture, and they see how much they fly apart, and it tells them how much energy there is. As they cool down, there's less and less energy in the bosons because they all start waving together in the same way and they all arrange themselves in that kind of configuration. The fermions, because they can't all wave together in the same way, they have to spread themselves out in our trap. They still have lots of energy as you go to lower temperature. In fact, they have more energy than the fermions. Look at this. This is really cool. This is why I love this picture. The bosons, a little bit of energy. They haven't spread out much between the time when we release them from our trap and take a picture. Fermions, much more energy. They spread out a lot, we take a picture, and they fly apart a lot. In fact, you could figure out from these pictures, I went through and did this, if you cooled all the way to absolute zero, how much, what would be the average speed of an atom in each of these gases? For the bosons, it would be a tenth of a degree, a tenth of a centimeter per second. So even at zero temperature, they're moving at a tenth of a, cent tenth of a centimeter per second. You can actually, that's even sort of about, Maybe this fast. They're still moving, but really slowly. The fermions are moving a lot more quickly. So they're moving a little bit. They're still moving really slow, so it's actually hard for me to even move that slow. Not that fast. But they're moving faster than the bosons. So two crazy things here have happened. Check it out. One, two things at the same temperature have different amounts of energy. And the atoms inside those things are moving at different speeds. The other crazy thing is, as you go to lower and lower temperature to absolute zero, they keep moving. They're always moving. What's up with that? Look at this. Two things we've seen now in the experiments we do with ultra cold temperatures. There's always motion, even at absolute zero. And things at the same temperature can have different amounts of energy. So what is temperature all about? Here's, here's the right answer to what temperature is. And this is something that, uh, if you go look on Google and the Wikipedia, and you try to learn all your science from that, unfortunately, you'll get it wrong. Here's, here's the real story. The temperature always tells us about which way energy will move. So if we have two boxes of atoms and we stick them together, and one is hotter than the other, then energy moves from the hot, and I didn't actually animate this, so don't look for anything amazing to happen here. Energy will move from the hot gas into the cold gas. And I also have a demo to show you that. And that's all temperature tells you about. It doesn't tell you anything, actually. It does say something, but um, it's not directly connected to even how fast things are moving. Uh, this is what's called a manometer. It's used for lots of different things. I'm going to use it for something very specific today to show you about this temperature and energy transfer thing. Here I have a, a bottle it's full of air, which is a gas. And it's connect that air is connected into this tube. Here, where there's a fluid, this green looking radioactive stuff. It's not radioactive, don't worry. What's going to happen is, I'm going to have to see if this thing's still on. Yeah, I can burn myself on that, that's good. Uh, barely. Okay, what's going to happen is if I stick this bottle, let's see if this works, into the warm water, this is warm water, you can see that the manometer, the fluid gets picked up. What's happening here? What's happening is that the hot water, it's hotter than the air inside this bottle. So I just told you that temperature tells you about which way energy moves. Energy moves from the hot water into the gas in the bottle, and that energy is used to do work against gravity and push this fluid up against gravity. That's exactly what temperature is all about. Transfer of energy. So I'm going to quit, and then we're going to have some time for questions, and I'll hang around for a while, and you can talk to me. But let me tell you, um, you know, I want to come back to why we do all of this. One thing, again, is that there's just all kinds of fundamental things you can learn about the universe by doing this kind of research. But what I've told you about today is really important, and it's everywhere around you. That might be hard to imagine. How is it everywhere around you? It only happens at these really, really low temperatures, like 100 billionths of a degree above absolute zero. Well, here's how it's all the way, always around you. Look at this picture. Here's a bunch of atoms in a box again. But what I've done is I've made the box really small. So the density is really high. Atoms are all packed into each other. 
even though the gas is kind of hot, these atoms are hot, and most of the waves are pretty short, the waves still overlap a lot. So that's something that's really deep in physics and turns out to be true, is that even at high temperatures, as long as the density is high enough and other things are true, for gases in a box like this, you can still see the quantum mechanics I told you about today, this funny behavior that when the waves start overlapping, funny things happen, and depending on if the things in the box are bosons and fermions, <coughs> In fact, so here's some examples for where this is all around you. One is in the structure and stability of matter. So who in chemistry classes see how electrons form um, these shells around atoms and part of this Pauli exclusion principle thing? Who's heard of that? Lots of people, that's good. So that Pauli exclusion principle thing you've heard about, that the atoms all have to stack up in these quantum states around the, around the nucleus of the atom, that's because the electrons are fermions. The waves can't overlap. They arrange themselves in a way where their waves don't overlap. And they form those shells zipping around them. So all the atoms in your body, because the, even though the electrons are zipping around a lot, they're moving really fast, because they're all packed in really close, so they're pretty tiny atoms, uh, the waves overlap, and this kind of physics I told you about today is really important. Also, who's wondered before about why you can stand on flippers on a, on a pool deck and not sink into the floor? Or maybe no one's thought about that, but what about me, standing on the floor right now? Why don't I sink into the floor? They won't have an idea. What's that? What? The floor is solid. That's pretty good, yeah. That's, that's true. The floor is solid. But what does that mean? The electrons in the floor are resisting the electrons in the shoe. Why is that? Because they have the same structure. That's interesting, too. But it turns out not to be true. What about you? I guess I think what you said about the electrons here are fermions, right? Right. So they're not going to let themselves overlap. So that's, that's right. Consistent. Well, well, no. The, the fact there is a force of repulsion between the electrons. But remember, we're all electrically neutral. Okay. So although there's all these electrons in my shoes and in the floor that are charged and want to repel each other, in fact, there's all these positive things and protons in my shoes and in the floor which help cancel that force out. In fact, there's lots of space between these things, too. The real reason you don't sink into the floor is because the electrons are fermions. So what happens whenever you bring two atoms close together, is that for a while, usually the atoms are attracted to each other, it turns out, from something called van der Waals forces, which you may have heard about in chemistry. But when they get close enough, the electrons around those atoms start to overlap. The waves of those electrons start to overlap. And they don't like that, right? Electrons are fermions, they try to arrange themselves in a way that the waves won't overlap. And they, find, they basically feel a force that gets incredibly strong as they get close to each other that pushes themselves apart. So this kind of physics I told you about today is why I don't sink into the floor when I'm standing here. Because it, all the constituents of the matter in my shoes and in the floor are fermions, and they can't interpenetrate each other. Other thing is that it turns out to understand the behavior of metals like wires and all the stuff in your computers, like semiconductors, you have to understand the physics of how waves and fermions behave when you put them in a box. And that's because all the electrons in the metals are fermions. And they actually kind of behave like these particles in a box. The electrons are kind of free to run around in the metal and are packed in really tight so the waves overlap. And if you want to understand how these things work, you have to understand that. You have to understand that the waves are overlapping and they find a way not to overlap. And that physics is really important there as well. So this stuff is all around you. Aside from the ultra cold <coughs> where we work, and we live at these extreme temperatures, this physics is all around you too. And the way that your atoms make up your body, the way that all these, um, you know, the fact that I can have skin, the way that proteins fit together, the fact that I don't sink into the floor, and the fact that my computer works. I'll do this part of my presentation. So, I'm going to end there, and I'm going to take lots of questions. Together with something called special relativity. We had a talk on that uh, last fall from George 
gone. Uh, and when you put those two things together, it turns out that you can see this physics. It's not really hard to understand. I had a class on it when I was getting my PhD, and to tell you the truth, I couldn't really reproduce it for you. Um, it's tough. But it's one of these things that really comes down to that's the way the universe works. Um, and at this level, that's the real answer. So that's the way it is. Uh, go ahead and back. Yes. Uh, so according to you, we can actually slow down time if you go to absolute zero because motion sort of slows down. Slow down time. It's not that time is slowing down. Uh, it's that things are just moving more slowly. Just I mean, does time slow down? And I'm going like this versus just kind of walking around. It's not that time slowing down. It's that uh, one thing's moving slower than the other. All right, how about, how about some other question? How about way in the back? <laughs> okay, that's a good question. Uh, so, so the fellow in the back is asking, is, is it true that the volume of something at absolute zero is zero? No, it's not true. Um, so we can look at my pictures again. For the bosons, remember I told you that because of the way waves work, when you put them in a box, there's a longest wave uh, they can have. And they're actually, so if you look at them, most of them have this wave right now. It's kind of hard to see them on top of each other. But that defines the volume at zero temperature. In fact, here's the volume of this gas, this big peak you see here in the middle. That's the volume. It turns out to be about 10 or 20 microns for this gas at zero temperature. For fermions, the volume is actually quite larger, and that's a great example that you probably brought this up. Because they have to all keep their waves apart from each other, they all stay way, way far apart from each other. And the volume is really large at zero temperature. In fact, in this picture, this is about the volume at zero temperature. And it's because those waves can overlap, they, find that they are forced to find a way to fill up the box where the waves don't overlap. How about this color right here? Yeah, uh, I'm watching this uh, green thing, and I was wondering yeah. why it, the level of the right of my right went down like it, like um, it was level at one point and then yeah that's a good question i also have some ice water here um, so i can transfer so it's colder than the gas in the bottle and i can transfer heat i can transfer energy from the air in that bottle into the ice water and that'll actually force it so i don't really answer your question why am i sitting out on the table like this and did that um, actually maybe one winter marion you know why i reverse it so It could be some of that I don't think that's it. Um, maybe we can maybe I'll do some experiments to find out. I don't know if this is essentially all figured out. Would you say that the <clears throat> that the energy moves from hot to cold? Right. And that since we heated the air in the bottle up a little bit, now right. it's moving out of the bottle and causing it. That could be. I mean that's basically an evaporative cooling process. So maybe that's what's going on. Is there some evaporative cooling that's moving out? That could be it. Anything else? How about you, right here? When you're using the bowl to cool your gas right. to very, very low, was the gas touching the bowl? And if so, how did you put that in the bowl? That's, that's a great question. Was the gas touching the bowl? How does that work? Well, that's why we, we do these experiments in these vacuum systems. So the first thing is, is we pull out of our vacuum system all the air out. So the air can't touch the atoms in here, and they can't heat it. The other thing is, um, the way that these bowls work, this is not a real bowl, I'm just using that as an analogy. Uh, let's see. We look at this thing. We're suspending the atoms that are like little magnets using magnetic fields. So they don't touch anything. We use magnetic fields to suspend them in the middle of that little glass cell in the vacuum system. And uh, that's how we're able to cool them. It's very important, actually, that they're suspended like that. And that, uh, oops. We don't do that when we do all the time. And uh, that the vacuum inside our vacuum system is really good to keep all the room temperature gas that are coming at us. So it's a good question. We have to be very careful to do this right with these experiments, or else you can't go to very low temperature. There's always heating going on. You have already asked, how about you right there? Uh, what's the wavelength of the laser you use from the other? That's a great question. Uh, it depends on the atom. Uh, for us, we work with these rubidium atoms, and the wavelength is 780 nanometers. So that's near infrared. Your eye can barely see it. In fact, some people can see it better than others. I know one guy who can't see it at all. I can see it pretty well. Uh, 
for other atoms like sodium, the, the, the wavelength is yellow. Uh, for atoms like lithium, it's more red. So it just depends on the atom. For us, this is near infrared color. So what, what implications does it have for the Big Bang theory? Okay. What implications does it have for those protons uh, and bosons? Uh, if, if one overlaps and one repels, how, how did, what implications does it have for you know, zero time or zero? This is an awesome question. Mm -hmm. So you've asked a question that I think a lot of physicists are working on right now and trying to understand. And there's, um, it's a problem based in cosmology as well as particle physics, the kind of thing that Kevin does. Um, and there are theories called supersymmetry theory, where we're trying to understand this kind of thing. And I certainly understand nothing about it. Um, but there are people who are working about it, trying to understand it. Maybe we can get a talk on that at one of these classes, or one of these Saturday morning sessions sometime. And that's a great question. It's a, it's a great question. I've had people yeah, focus on it. Okay, so that's what it is. So Inga says, and maybe Tony Liss will talk we'll about it. that question. Yes, yeah, so ask Tony about it. Because he, he probably understands it much better than I understand it. So anything he knows is more than me. Uh, let's look for someone who knew. Uh, how about you? Uh, if you take, like, like a whole thing that's inactable, right. and fill it up, right. like, uh, the maximum is the same. Right. And then do that, like, since all the molecules are bouncing off each other, and all these great questions. Yeah, actually, so there's a problem um, for our trick if the density is too high. And the, the problem is that the atoms can't find their way out of the bowl. And so we have to be really careful to control the density and not let it be too high when we do these experiments, or else that problem actually happens. It's a great question. It's something we actually worried about all the time. So the question was, in case anyone didn't hear it, if, if we packed too many atoms into our bowl so that they sort of couldn't find their way out of the bowl, what would happen? And yeah, there's a problem with the cooling. For the cooling process to work, the atoms have to find a way out of the bowl. So if the density is too high, they can't do that. And the cooling shuts down. That's a great question. How about you, were there? Can you tie in the concept of protons and bosons and the strings? Oh, that's another question that I can't answer. Maybe Tony Liss can answer it. So I'll tell you right now, Tony won't be able to answer yeah. that one. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for that is there, we don't understand it. There are people basically trying to work on this and understand this question. But we don't know that. Uh, and we'd like to know. Uh, the question is, uh, actually, your question was, if I could even remember it now, uh, any more coffee. Can we tie in this concept of bosons and fermions to string theory? Is that it? Yeah. And people would like to understand how to do this, and people are working on it, and I certainly don't understand it, and I think this is a great open question in tough, tough physics. Uh, how about you? So it's like, my these questions starts to be a problem, but they'll still find a way to configure themselves in a way that they overlap as little as possible. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, I think part of the problem is we, uh, I'm going to talk about something I really don't know anything about, but for the Big Bang, uh, the universe is a really different place, um, and that's, uh, people are trying to understand what was the nature of matter at that time. And for example, could we divide up the world at that time into bosons and fermions, or there's some better way to look at it? And that's why I think people don't understand what they're trying, trying to work out. About mm -hmm. the back. Yeah. Uh, so your apparatus seems to be like a few, a few inch size. It's it's about this big. And uh, the depth distance is enough to, I mean, uh, how do you call it? So insulating yeah. the room temp to the uh, yeah. zero? Yeah, and the, yeah, that's a great question. It seems crazy, right? That, so that 
basically, um, these little glass cells we work with, the atoms are about an inch away from the walls. So how can we insulate it from zero, from the room temperature, which is 300 Kelvin, and cool something to 100 billionths of a degree above absolute zero? It's because we make a really good thermos. So there's nothing in between the atoms and the wall. We've sucked out all the air. So there's no way to transfer energy between room temperature, the walls of the glass, and the atoms that we track using our magnetic fields. And it's just a really great thermos. In fact, when you buy thermoses, the best thermoses you buy have a little bit of vacuum in the wall. And they use that same trick. Um, and that's how we're able to do that. We just make a really good vacuum. If the vacuum's not good enough, in fact, we can't cool them because energy gets transferred from room temperature into the atoms. And that's a big problem. Uh, so we have to work really hard and make a really good vacuum. We're super clean. We bake our vacuum system out to 350 degrees C for a couple of weeks to bake all the gunk off of it um, to make sure the vacuum's really good. It's, it's hard. Well, you were here. What then is the radiant temperature of the thing? It doesn't have a finite temperature relative to where it's going. It does. But the rate of that's true, and it's room temperature. But the thing is, is there's no way for energy to move from the thing at room temperature to the thing that's really cold. So the only way uh, the only process that's efficient to do that is if um, basically a uh, nitrogen air molecule inside our vacuum system bangs into the wall of the glass, picks up a lot of energy from everything outside of it, and it comes into the um, to the atoms we're trapping and cooling and transfers that energy in. Okay, so it's, what about the black body? Okay, so, so you know things. Um, yeah, it turns out that, that uh, black body radiation at you know, room temperature, the 10 micron radiation, uh, is not strong enough, it's the rate of transfer of energy is not high enough. Our cooling rates are much faster. In those heating rates, much, 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 much faster. And so we're able to take energy out much faster than black body radiation from the room is transferring it in. So, so this fellow raises a really good point. So um, remember, I was telling you everything in the universe flows, okay, even room temperature is flowing, this 10 micron radiation. Uh, you can imagine that radiation, that light, comes in from the room and, and gets tr transferred into the atoms. It turns out that that is a problem, but I don't know. A scale that's not really relevant to us. So that rate of energy transfer from that process is so weak that it doesn't really heat up the atoms quickly enough compared to how fast we can cool them. So, so that turns out to be okay. Although it's something to keep worried about about 10 years ago. How about all the way back? Okay, how about one more question all the way in the back and then turn something up to go? Okay, so, so here's a good question. Um, is it possible to reach absolute zero and because there's still motion? So that's my message to you today, is that even at absolute zero, there's always motion. So that's the point. Because of the way these waves work when you put them in a box, things are always waving. Even, at, even when they're not moving, they're always waving. And what that means is that, okay, I should be careful. When they have as little energy as possible, they're still moving around because they're waves and they're always waving. And so that means even at zero temperature, when they're waving as little as possible, they're still moving around. And so that means, that, that's the most important thing, is that it's not true that all motion ceases at absolute zero. There's always motion, even at zero temperature. And that's because that idea of temperature being connected to motion is not correct. It's mostly correct. It works really well for everyday life. But um, in reality, for the experiments we do, and for example, for describing metals and semiconductors, that idea doesn't work anymore. So we have to stop now. And uh, thanks for coming today. Hope you enjoyed it.